Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Bob Lang from Explosive Options. It's Tuesday, July 26, and we'll talk about this market really selling off through the course of the day, leading into some pretty major league earnings we have coming after the close today. We have a couple small companies you may not have heard of, things like Alphabet and Microsoft, with some significant market moving potential. This begins or really continues this stretch of really market moving uh, earnings. What happens leading into the Fed tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen? This is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny and hot Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit has evolved over decades, uh, if not centuries, to help us better understand investor psychology, better quantify investor behavior, and understand the lessons of market history and the reality of market dynamics. So what does this mean as the market sells off going into this uh, or continuing here on a Tuesday as this uh, in this heavy earnings week and leading up to the Fed meeting tomorrow? So the market is all about expectations, right? If you ask, what does the stock market represent? In my opinion, it represents expectations or represent, represents expectations for the economic conditions, for uh, the activity of the Fed and liquidity and what that means for uh, the market environment. It's current, really not as much current earnings and more future earnings, right? Expectations about where earnings may be headed. You have to remember that if you're trying to understand the economy, you should try to understand the uh, stock market first, right? The best leading indicator that we know of for the economy is the stock market. So let's focus on the trends, the information that the market provides back to us and see what we can make sense of. Now we have great guests on the show. I'm really excited to talk to uh, Bob Lang from Explosive Options, one of my favorites, uh, to talk about some of the, the benchmarks, some of the key uh, indicators that he's been following. Coming up the remainder of this week on uh, Wednesday, the 27th, we have Dale Pinkert from Forex Analytics. On Thursday, the 28th, Mish Schneider, host of Mish's Market Minute here on Stock Charts TV. And then next week on Tuesday, August 2nd, Jonathan Krinsky will be joining us from, uh, from uh, Minnesota. So a lot of great guests uh, coming along. All of our previous discussions, of course, are on StockChartsTV.com, our on-demand platform. Let's continue today's show and let's recap these markets. Let's see what's happening as we talk about this sort of slow deterioration through the course of the day. First, though, I have a really interesting poll that I'd like to share with you. We asked you recently on our live stream page, so if you go to StockCharts TV's uh, homepage on our, uh, on our StockCharts website, we always have a poll going just to the right of the video. Also on our, our YouTube channel and on our social media outlets, so make sure you give us a follow and subscribe where you can. We asked you which sector performs the best over the next three months. I thought this was interesting. 49% of you, about half of you said technology. After that, 27% answered energy and then tied 12% each for financials and consumer discretionary. I'll be honest, I was a little surprised that technology got the vote. Now, what's interesting is we've asked this over the last couple of days, which means we're coming off of last week where technology sort of leading, uh, pushing higher, sort of sell, uh, rallying a little bit, pushing the S&P and the NASDAQ certainly to a, to a new swing high leading into this week. What's funny is those are some of the sectors that are struggling quite a bit uh, today, for example, technology down uh, almost uh, as much as communication services, then consumer discretionary by far the, the worst performer of the bunch. So it's interesting. This draws me back. This poll drink, brings me back to Sam Stovall's idealized chart of sector leadership. If you go to our sector perf chart, and I didn't mean to go through that so quickly. If you go to our charts and tools section on the right side toward the bottom, there's this sector performance chart. It's a great way to just quickly visualize uh, the returns in different uh, sectors and also whatever other tickers you put in there on the top over a different period of time. But just below that chart, there's Sam Stovall's idealized sector rotation model. In the orange, we have the, uh, the market cycle in a bear market phase. You tend to get leadership from utilities, real estate, and financials. As the market bottoms and starts to improve, 
you tend to get leadership from two sectors, technology and consumer discretionary. So the fact that 50% of you think technology is going to be the best performer over the next three months, in my mind, you're pricing in a market bottom. I don't disagree with that general thesis that three months from now, hopefully we've bottomed by then. Um, maybe we've already seen the bottom for the year. I don't think so. But the charts and the, uh, the evidence will certainly help us make that decision over time. This week, we certainly have the possibility of technology beginning or maybe continuing its leadership and maybe leading the way out of this market bottoming phase into a bull market. Markets don't sometimes bottom on a dime, although that is what happened in 2020 after the market sold off February to March. It doesn't always happen that way. So we'll have to look at the evidence together, see what we can see. Let's look at the markets today and see what actually played out. The S&P was down about 1.2% to 39.21. The NASDAQ composite was down even more with the NASDAQ 100 down about 2% today, getting near and near to that 12,000 level. The NASDAQ uh, composite, sorry, excuse me, the NASDAQ composite uh, down about 1.9%. And the VIX pushing higher, actually, the VIX back up to uh, 25. It's interesting to see how the VIX has pulled back in a similar way to previous uh, uh, bear market rallies before the market reverts lower. And that might be an interesting um, sort of narrative to follow through the course of this week, what happens to, uh, to volatility. In terms of interest rates coming off a bit, the 10-year yield is currently around 279. That's down from where we were recently, obviously above 3%. The long bond yield is just above uh, 3%. Bond prices essentially flat from where they were yesterday. The dollar index pushing back to the upside with the UUP up about 0.8%. One of my... Um, I think it was one of the either one of my guests or a question we got uh, from uh, from one of our viewers called uh, the U.S. dollar the wrecking ball for risk assets, and you saw the dollar rally uh, today as other things started to uh, to struggle a little bit. Sort of mixed results here on the commodities page. Commodity complex overall up just a bit. Gold flat and silver up a bit. Uh, the energy sector was down a little bit today, about 0.9% for the XLE. Cryptocurrencies continue to move lower, and I think this is one of those challenges to any bull thesis, those of you that are bullish, and again, I, I totally get it, and I can see how you could start to draw on this short-term strength and see the signs of the beginning of a recovery. I totally get the argument. One thing that does not fit into that narrative, though, is weakness in cryptocurrencies, right? Now, again, I'm not saying cryptos and stocks line up perfectly, and I don't know if cryptocurrencies are necessarily the perfect ideal risk asset, but it is sort of a good proxy for speculation. I don't feel great about the prospects of the equity markets moving significantly higher if cryptocurrencies continue to push lower. And that's what you've seen with Bitcoin. Rallied a little bit, Ether rallied a little bit, and now starting to roll over. Days like this, Ethereum down another 4.5%, almost 5% today. Um, so continue to show some short-term weakness. If you're bullish on stocks, I think you want to see these things start to rotate higher because that would indicate people taking on additional risk. Right now, you're seeing people get away from a fairly speculative instrument uh, like Bitcoin and uh, and Ether. Let's look at a chart of the S&P here as we finish off our market recap and look at how things played out. So today, the S&P pulling back a little bit, closing almost to the penny at the 50-day moving average. Now, this is a really interesting point that the S&P is at. If you look at the last two months, right? So two months ago, sort of in mid-late May, we were right around the same price level, around 39.20, right? Uh, right around that level. From there, we rallied up to uh, just below 4,200, we'll call it 4,150 or so. And then we sold off to around 3,650. And then we came back right around to the midpoint, which is where we're at now. So over the last two months, directionally, we have gone nowhere. We are flat for that two month period, even though it's been sort of a noisy ride, you know, you've seen some upswings and some downswings. Now, of course, is the uh, is the decision point. In the short term, we have clear resistance at 4,000. That was the high from, or the, the close from last Thursday, Friday session pulling right back and now continuing to drop into uh, today's close. And now we have the 50 day moving average right around 39.20, pretty much where we close today. I'd love to see which way this market breaks during the course of this week. We have plenty of reasons why the market could move higher or lower, and we'll have to see how earnings from companies like Alphabet and Microsoft and Apple and Amazon move the needle. Also, the Fed meeting tomorrow, which is yet another thing, you know, this prospect of much higher rates, what that means for the yield curve. We have the inverted yield curve recently, which is often a good predecessor or a good indication of uh, recession. Uh, so we'll see how all of that plays out. I think by the end of this week, we probably have a little more uh, sense of where the next move may be, given how the market reacts to all this. So far, leading into all of these announcements, certainly weaker rather than stronger, coming off the strong uh, week last week. On a larger basis, 
We have a little broader reference, around 4150 on the upper end, 3650 on the lower end. We have clear resistance and we have clear support. The reality is the market itself could bounce around quite a bit for some period of time. You have to remember, although we love to think of the markets as binary, we're either bullish or bearish, there is a third option, which is sideways. To be honest, this is what the two months have been. I think the last two months have all been about testing that 3800, 3810 level. That's a key Fibonacci level, as we've talked about many times on the show. We then bounced below there. We then sort of bounced around there. And now we're bouncing up a little bit off of those levels. At the end of the day, it's still about the market addressing this key level of support. And if and when we break down through there, if there's enough of a downside catalyst from the Fed from earnings this week, we could certainly see the market move up, move lower. But first things first, let's focus on the shorter term range around 4,000 to 3,900 and see what this week does to break, their, uh, break to the upside or the downside out of that trading range. Just to finish off our recap here very quickly, some of the industrial stocks actually the best performers with 3M. GE up four and a half to uh, to five percent, but utilities and healthcare really the two top sectors, both up about half a percent plus, followed by real estate. Everything else in the red, and it's worth noting, leading into a bunch of Fang earnings, the three Fang sectors on the struggle bus today, all down uh, and uh, underperforming the S and P five hundred. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Bob Lang. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down this market environment using the power of stock charts. A couple of quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Bob Lang. First off, we welcome your questions. We're featuring a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we love to answer one of your questions live on the air in our next mailbag on Friday's show. Shoot us your questions via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We are on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live in the air in our next mailbag segment. Also, go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on-demand platform. We have such fantastic guests, people like Bob Lang, um, Tony Dwyer, Larry Williams, so many more, along with a lot of special events like The Pitch, our Mid-Year Market Outlook coming up in a couple of weeks, and so much more, all for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Bob Lang. Bob's the president of Explosive Options, joining us from Cape Cod. Bob, it is great to see you again. It looks beautiful where you are, and thanks for taking a few moments away from that to share some insights with us. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Dave, and thank you very much for having me on today. It's a, uh, it's a wild day in the markets, hasn't it been? So it, it really was, right? And you have a lot of, uh, you know, a, a pretty decent week last week, all of a sudden showing some weakness leading into a bunch of catalysts. You have some charts, uh, some charts that you shared with us to give us a sense of what you're seeing. We're starting with some breadth analysis. Talk us through this one for us. So this is a uh, chart of the S&P 500 uh, stocks, Dave, above the 50-day moving average. And and generally, what we'd like to see here is prints above the 50 uh, level. So this goes on a, on a it's more of like a stochastic type of a, a of a uh, uh, residue here from zero to 100. And so anything below 50 is what we call no bueno for the for the markets here. It's no good. So anything above 50 prints above 50 uh, exhibits a strong, good, positive health for the markets. But anything below 50 is not good. So uh, what I wanted to do is isolate on this and show you that for the majority of 2022, uh, the S&P 500 has been in a bear market. So I would say mm -hmm. that anything below that 50 print, Dave, is um, is bear market territory. And then if you look at that middle part of June, that that lowest print there, we were we were at about two percent. So two percent of the uh, of the S&P 500 is um, 10, 11 names. So 490 something names were in bear markets back in the middle of June uh, in uh, uh, just a little over a month ago. So that that was a pretty extreme level. And of course, we we bounced off of that. But and we now now we're back above that line here again. But as you can see, the prior two or three times that we were above that blue line, 
um, that we didn't we didn't stay up up there uh, for for very long, especially at the uh, beginning part of June. And once we cracked below it, um, that was a uh, that was a bad sign for the market. So I'm I'm worried here if I'm a bull that if we crack below that blue line, uh, it's going to fall apart and we're going to come down and retest those lows from June and possibly, perhaps even lower. You know, so many people, I think, have gotten drawn into the short term strength off of those lows in June. This is a great reminder that other bear market rallies have had sudden moves off the lows, but they tend to resolve lower. Now, this next one is looking at a similar breadth indicator in the NASDAQ, right? Yeah. And, and I, I know you reference this chart quite a bit as well, too. This is a, and I look at 20 period moving average. It's about a month's worth of uh, worth of activity. And, uh, you know, it, this, this kind of gives it, it's a great dynamic to see you know, where are the short-term trends uh, lie? And again, much like the S&P 500 chart, the NASDAQ has spent a generous amount of time below that 50 level. And again, that is a, a point where we, we have to, we have to have, throw the red flag up and say, look, there's some caution here. Now, of course, we just, we just went up there more recently, about a week or so ago. It didn't take much effort to get above that blue line, but now again, we're heading down again. And if we get down below that blue line one more time, Again, look what happened in June and look what happened in the early part of April. Once we broke that blue line, it was um, all hell broke loose for the, for the markets. And I suspect, listen, you know what? We're, we're still in a bear market until, until further notice. And if, if, if this repeats itself, you, you've got to have some protection on. You've got to be doing some selling and uh, be ready for that next uh, wave down. Your third chart, Bob, is now switching gears a little bit. We're going to look at volatility. This is the VIX. Right. So the VIX, the volatility index, has been making its way lower since the uh, middle part of, of June. And when we hit that low uh, around June 17th, we've been coming low, uh, coming lower, making lower highs, lower lows in the VIX. We we hit that 200-day moving average. We closed a little bit above there uh, today. And uh, you know the, the the nice thing, the positive I would say here is that blue line, which is the 20-day moving average, below uh, making a run towards that 200. Now if it crosses under it, like we had earlier in the year, um, that would be a positive sign. But then we've had two other instances, Dave, uh, when uh, we, we came close to that crossing uh, crossing level and we didn't quite get there and the markets turned right back down again. Um, I'm worried that there's a lot of complacency in the market here. We, we, we've talked recently uh, about the VIVIX and the SKU index, which have been indicating that too much complacency in this market. And uh, when the VIX is having dropped from about 36% all the way down to 23 um, there, there are not people worried about uh, markets going down right now. And that always has me concerned. Mm, that's a great way of, uh, of describing all of that. Just to finish off here, um, let's say new highs and new lows. Sorry, I skipped this one here. But the last one I wanted to talk, wanted you to, to talk about, NYSE new highs versus new lows. So this is one that I uh, indicator that I follow quite closely here. And, and again, this is a, another one where we'd like to see prints above zero, um, preferably above 100. Um, that that would mean what? How many new highs are being printed versus new lows? And and again, if you if you hit, if you draw a line at that zero, Dave, you'll see that uh, once again for the past seven eight months we have seen um, markets spending a generous amount of time in in bear territory, and most of the time it's been under that zero line, which is that which is that blue line you, you just put in there. How many prints above that zero line have we seen? Hardly any. And, and a generous, again, a generous amount of time spent below there. So we've, we've had a preponderance uh, of new lows versus new highs in this market. Again, indicative of what we've been having to deal with here in this bear market. So when, this, when does this bear market end? When we see um, the flip-flop of this, when we see a lot more prints above that, uh, above the, above that blue line. I'm not going to predict when that's going to happen, of course. But uh, you know what? when we get to that point in that level, um, I'm willing to turn a little bit, a little bit less bearish and probably a little bit more bullish. It's hard to imagine the market really mounting a significant recovery without a decent number of new highs. And as you're showing, haven't quite seen it yet. Bob, listen, that's a, such a great take in five minutes. That was solid. I really appreciate you sharing some charts with us. Enjoy the weather there. Enjoy the Cape and uh, we'll have you on again soon. Okay. Great to be with you, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Bob. So that's Bob Lang, the president of Explosive Options. And I love it. He, he had a number of comments. I'd love to just go through so many of those if we had uh, if we had time for it. But just that process of, of looking through the breadth, thinking about the rally in some of those indicators, single digits of S&P members above their 50-day 
about a month ago, six weeks ago, right in the uh, in the June uh, low. But then all of a sudden it goes to about 50 percent. But look at what's happened. This is very classic for some of these bear market rallies that we've uh, that we've seen so far. And a great chart at the end there, new highs versus new lows. And, uh, and seeing if we can get an increase in new highs, which often uh, would be uh, be the leadership that would help us drive to, uh, to a new leg higher. Great take there from uh, Bob Lang at Explosive Options. Let's continue on today's show, uh, folks, and go to the Final Bar Mailbag. As a reminder, the mailbag is always open at the Final Bar at StockCharts.com. And let's get to your first question. Dave, I haven't been able to find a tool that will provide a numerical or quantitative way to measure the relative strength of an investment. Does such a tool exist? And you also went on to talk about uh, you know, you've come to a fuller appreciation of the value of relative strength when evaluating and comparing stocks. And I, I would say in your question is embedded a lot of wisdom. Uh, hopefully on this show, I have reinforced over and over the value of relative strength because what I have found is that most institutional investors, we spent most of our time looking at relative strength because that was the game. It was all about outperforming a passive investment, right? How can we outperform? And in bear markets, it is quite honestly much easier to outperform if you can get defensive and you can ride out periods of uh, market dislocation. Having said that, what are the ways you can measure it? So if you look at relative strength on a particular index or a particular asset, a particular equity, you're just understanding its relative performance over time. But how do you compare relative strength over different things? This is the essence of the stock charts technical ranking, right? The SCTR or scooter ranking. This is literally a quantitative model, for lack of a better description, that takes momentum on three different timeframes, long-term, medium-term, and short-term, and percentile rank stocks based on the relative strength. So there are two ways that I'll share with you. The scooter ranking is really intended to do this. And by basically taking a group of stocks a universe and sorting them and basically taking their raw momentum values and percentile ranking them, you have a beautiful measure of relative strength because the stronger relative movers are gonna have a higher SCTR, stock charts technical ranking. So what you wanna be doing is looking for stocks with a high scooter ranking. The other thing I would tell you is in our scanning engine, another thing that you can do is look at returns. So we actually have an argument called relative strength. And oh man, I should have looked at this before I popped this in here, but I think I did. Here we go. So basically we have an argument in our scanning engine called PCT relative, which is basically saying, I want the percent relative over this period relative to this asset. So what I'm saying here, here is go through the S&P 500 members and look for stocks where it's making a new high, meaning new relative high, meaning its relative strength looking back over the last 10 days versus the S&P is higher than the max that I saw yesterday for that same indicator for the last 65 days. You can also say, I just want the percent relative to be above a certain value. I want something that's outperformed the S&P by at least 10% over the last 20 trading days. You can use all those kind of arguments in our scanning engine to filter on stocks that have outperformed whatever you want to put in the denominator by a certain percentage or compared to a certain look back period that it's at a high or a low or something like that. You can do it between uh, you know different percentage returns. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with it. This is just the tip of the, uh, of the iceberg. So if you hit pause and review this, this is the argument that you want. If you look at our chart school section, we explain a lot more about the scanning engine and how to use this particular line to scan on particular performance. But easy way to do it is I would just use the scooter rankings. That is what they are designed to do. Next question on the industry summary page, is there a way to get the market caps of those stocks? I know it says small, mid, and large, but I'm trying to cross-reference those in the SPY to rank them by market cap. Really good question. So you mentioned the industry summary tab, the industry summary report. I would actually, for this, I would actually use a chart list. It's a little bit easier. So I have a chart list that I use that just has the members of the S&P 500 index uh, and I group them by sector and industry because that's something I, I tend to want to do. But once you bring in all of these uh, stocks, you can bring in whatever list you want. I have the S&P members. Make sure you go to columns and make sure you have market cap added as a column. There are a bunch of other columns I'm not showing, like the next earnings date and stuff like that. That's pretty cool, too. But what you can then do is say, I want to sort it on market cap first and then by sector. What I've now done is I've started with market cap. And then by clicking on sector first, it's now going to group by sector. And in each sector, it's doing it in order, descending order of market cap. So by clicking on these different column headings in different orders, 
you can uh, sort this list by whatever you want. This would be the way I would actually do that to get particular uh, market cap orders for a, any list of stocks. Next question, are the Dow Jones industry charts market value weighted or equal weighted? Really good question. So if you go here to our industry summary tab, these are all the Dow industry groups and we map them to the S&P sectors. It's kind of a proprietary whole process we use to map different industries to different sectors outside the scope of this question to, uh, to explain in any more detail what we do, but that's what we're doing. And these are all tickerized. So if I do dollar sign DJUSNS, this is the Dow Jones US Internet Index. By the way, if you don't know those, just type internet and it'll be able to uh, keyword search and you can find the appropriate uh, industry groups and, and also a bunch of other indexes as well. The Dow Jones indexes are all price weighted. So it's not equal weighted and it's not cap weighted. It's actually price weighted. So it's a third option. I don't know if you really, if you really uh, outlined it. Cap weighted indexes would be things like the S&P 500, right? Uh, which are or the NASDAQ uh, composite and NASDAQ 100, which means the larger market cap is a larger weighting in the index. Equal weighted would be if I have 50 stocks, each one of them have an equal weighting. So there are equal weighted uh, ETFs like um, RCD for consumer discretionary, which basically weights each stock individually so they all have an equal exposure. Price weighted is how the Dow, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow Transports, and the Dow Industry Indexes are weighted, which means higher price value higher weighting. It's not an ideal way to do it because a lot of times stocks will split and the prices mean different things. And all of a sudden the weightings are going to change a little bit. That is how the good people at Dow Jones have been doing that for a long, long period of time. And that is why they do it. Is it a perfect method? Probably not, but that is how they're doing it. Last question. So S&P 4200 or greater would be what would convince you that we're back in a bull trend. What's the best way to play that? I should not have taken a question that complex in just a few moments. But here's my quick answer to that. What does that mean? S&P 4200. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because that was the swing high from the end of May, early June. If we get above there, get above that last Fibonacci retracement level, you will hear me saying this is a market in a bullish configuration because there'll be so many things that would have to happen in terms of breadth and sentiment that would happen along the way that I think would validate that uptrend. So in my opinion, that would do it. However, I think as my guest Bob Lang said, I think at this point, I would still be thinking of rallies as things to be sold, not things to be bought until you get to that point. That's what would tell you that there's enough buying power built up and being expressed in higher stock prices to justify further upside. So at this point, these sorts of bear market rallies, I think, are things more to be faded uh, than bought. And that is in, just in my interpretation of how I would be approaching those particular movements. That's all the time we have for the mailbag. We keep the great questions coming. We need to wrap the show and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the high yield option adjusted spread. Do not be frightened by that wordy and complex title. Here's what this means. High yield bonds are bonds of risky companies. Basically, a high yield spread tells you what premium, what spread that investors are demanding to take on the additional risk inherent in riskier companies. So the higher this value, the more, uh, the more um, let's say, negative that is for the market because investors are demanding more and more additional return in on those bonds for taking on the risk of, uh, of exposure to those companies because a riskier company, a riskier environment means higher probability that they won't be able to fulfill their debt obligations. I've plotted this inversely. So spreads are narrowing if it goes up and spreads are widening when it goes down because the further it goes down, the more negative that is for stocks, the more that goes up, the more bullish that is for stocks. That's why the S&P is here at the bottom. In the middle series, I'm showing the VIX and Bob Lang, my guest today, did a great job talking about volatility. This recent drop in the VIX getting back to 24, overall, these have all rallied nicely. Do they roll over to the downside? That's why that's a chart I'm watching today. Alphabet and Microsoft just reported earnings after the close. We didn't have a chance to get to those, but Coke reported earlier in the day and rallied nicely. Do these tech and uh, communications names go down? Do consumer staples go up? That is your bear market thesis expressed in one chart. That's why that's a good one to watch. Finally, the global wrecking ball of the US dollar overall has pulled back. That has given space for growth stocks to work and for other things to work as well. If that is a short-term bottom and we revert back to the upside and overall, I would argue that long-term trend is still positive. That is positive for the dollar and not positive for other risk assets. Folks, that is a wrap for this show. Special thank you to Bob Lang from Explosive Options joining us from New England. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.